It's no secret the Vice President of the United States is here. I'll get to him in a minute. Uh, first of all, Tampa General Hospital cardiologist and medical director of the heart transplant, Debbie Rindy Hoffman, is here tonight. She's taking the stage. Thank you. The other person is Kathleen Shanahan. She'll be moderating the discussion. Kathleen is the chair of Groundwork Solutions uh, on the board of Turtle and Hughes, among other companies. She's one of those rare leaders that has blended politics and business and has done both spectacularly. I do mean that, Kathleen. And most importantly, many of you may not know this, but Kathleen Shanahan was Dick Cheney's chief of staff. And she was his chief of staff right after he got elected to be the vice president with George W. Bush back in 2000, after a pretty easy election. There was no problems in 2000. Ballots got counted just perfectly. Um, but taking on that role under those circumstances, really difficult. And she did a spectacular job. And of course, the vice president, Dick Cheney, the 46th vice president, in addition to being the secretary of defense, he was the White House chief of staff when he was age 34. Uh, the youngest chief of staff in the history of the United States. He was also a congressman. He was also the Secretary of Defense. He was also the chairman and CEO of Halliburton, which is a Fortune 500 company. And Mr. Cheney is also a grandfather, a husband, a six-time heart disease survivor. Um, if, if you don't know this, so the vice president has suffered five heart attacks, one sudden cardiac arrest, had a heart transplant, is obviously doing very well. He has not only survived, he has thrived. This guy is sharp as a tack. You will love hearing him speak tonight. He's an incredible man. I can't speak enough about him. I, I, love, I love him. He's, he's such a great leader. He's so committed to be here. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say, to get here for him today was very difficult. He was at the services for Barbara Bush this morning, just got off an airplane an hour ago, and he drove straight here. Um, So he didn't even have a chance to change clothes. He looks pretty damn good. He's been going since 6 o'clock this morning. So without further ado, Mr. Vice President, Kathleen, doctor, take it away. Great. Thank you, Ken. It's really great to be here, and I'm just going to give one plug. I think everybody should, at the end of this, consider reading this book. It's a book Dick Cheney wrote along with his cardiologist. Dr. Wendy Hoffman has read it, and she's going to ask some tremendous questions. She is a star cardiologist at Tampa General, and we're thrilled to have her here to sort of ask some of the substantive questions just about Mr. Vice President's heart. Go ahead, Wendy. Okay. So first, I'd like to say that I am thrilled and honored to be on this stage tonight with former Vice President Cheney. Thank you to Tampa General and our amazing CEO, for the trust in having me up here, for the American Heart Association for giving me this opportunity of a lifetime, and for Mr. Cheney for being here with us tonight after the last very few difficult days that you've had. So we'll get started. Living by the mantra, when in doubt, check it out. You have never ignored the warning signs and symptoms of your cardiac events. By doing so, you have most likely saved your own life on more than one occasion. Many people would push these warning signs to the side. Why is it critical that people listen to their bodies and call 911 or see a doctor if they feel like something's wrong? Well, I uh, think back, I remember that first heart attack, which was 40 years ago, June. I was 37, running for Congress the first time, staying with friends in Cheyenne, and in the middle of the night, I woke up with a tingling sensation in just these two fingers. Not the whole arm or anything, just these two fingers. And uh, the only thing I can think of that made me especially sensitive was my first cousin was a doctor over in Idaho. And he'd had a bad heart attack a couple of months before. And I just thought, I better go have this checked out. So we loaded in the car, they took me to the hospital, I walked into the emergency room and passed out on the table. I was having my first heart attack. Um, no question but what uh, uh, getting there Immediately, as soon as you have a symptom, there's, there's nothing involved if you're wrong except maybe a little embarrassment, and it's worth it. And uh, I used to, came up on a number of occasions when George Bush was considering me for his running mate in 2000. I tried to explain to him all the reasons why he shouldn't. One of which was, Mr. President, if I feel a twinge, 
in the middle of the vice presidential debate. I'm out of there. I'm blowing the joint, headed for the nearest emergency room. And uh, the good news is that I didn't have another episode until 17 days after the election. And my only responsibility was to not have a heart attack during the campaign. So you can imagine the joy I had that morning. I got the call. He was headed to George Washington Hospital. Dr. Wendy, do you have any comments on the question that you asked him? So just as your mantra has been, when in doubt, check it out, the mantra for the cardiologist is time is muscle. Cardiac damage starts within the first hour of having a heart attack, and by six hours, it's complete. There are no do-overs. We're all born with one heart, and for most of us, it has to last most of our lives. Some of us get lucky enough to have two. A heart attack occurs in the United States every 38 seconds, and a death from cardiovascular disease in the United States every 40 seconds. So we mean it when we say, get to the hospital. Better safe than sorry. The life you save may be your own. Next question. Okay, next question. In your book, you often speak about the long-term relationship you have with your cardiologist, Dr. Reiner. In these days of computerized medicine, it is easy for the doctor-patient relationship to become impersonal. How important is this relationship in facilitating the management of your disease and in recognizing developing complications? I had the experience, uh, so I had that first heart attack in my first campaign, but a few years later, and it would have been 1984, I'm a member of Congress, and uh, I developed what I thought was chest pain, and so they took me out to Bethesda Naval Hospital and uh, discovered out there that I was again having another mild heart attack. The, uh, and the docs were great out there. I don't mean to be critical at all about uh, military medicine. They do a superb job. But I never knew who my doctor was until he walked through the door of the, of the room that morning. And I made a judgment that the one thing I could have some control over is find me a really good doctor, make the choice myself based upon all the relevant factors I could come up with. And so I actually, the author in Washington who uh, evaluated doctors, I went to him asked for his advice and guidance. He recommended a man named Alan Ross, who was the top doc at uh, George Washington Hospital then. And I went to Alan and asked him to take my case. He did, uh, and, and that was a crucial decision. When he retired a few years later, I took John Reiner, who was a relatively new doc, had finished, just finished all of his uh, education and schooling. And uh, that's been such a close relationship that uh, it, it means the world to me. I don't deal with a hangnail unless I check with John first. And uh, he's been just superb as an advisor and, and uh, we have sometimes had disagreements. At one point we both were, I was invited to go to the uh, Cleveland Clinic because they were having a convention on innovation in cardiology and they'd done some research and found I'd had everything done to me you could do to a heart patient. So they flew us up and we spent a day on the stage with a room full of doctors and equipment suppliers, uh, talking about what it was like to be on the receiving end of all of that. It was very, one of my closest relationships, and uh, to the extent you ha are fortunate enough to be able to pick your doctor, uh, and uh, in this case I was, it's been vital. It, John has saved my life on more than one occasion. I'm sure Dr. Debbie has some comments on the doctor-patient relationship. So in my opinion, the doctor-patient relationship is sacred. I think our patients get better care when that relationship is strong. We often see patients when they're in pain, they're scared, and they have a total lack of control. When you get involved with serious medical illnesses, the medical system can be downright scary. Lots of people walking in and out of your room, lots of tests being done, poking, prodding, people standing in front of you more interested in a computer than you. That's where the doctor-patient relationship really helps. That doctor that you know, he, he or she knows the nuances of your case. He knows or she knows what's been tried and hasn't worked before. We can calm fears, ease anxiety, and help patients make decisions and help them through to the next phases of care. I think our patients deserve our full and undivided attention. So you've had a long career of public service. Mm -hmm. Chief of Staff, Secretary of Defense, 
and many other very important jobs serving this country. How do you find the time or how do you balance the stress of those jobs in terms of your own health? Well, that's an interesting question. I've had a dispute over the years with my, uh, my cardiologist. Not only did medicine do a superb job of keeping me alive, it allowed me to function at a very high level uh, in spite of the fact that I was a heart patient. Um, say 10 years in the, in the House of Representatives, uh, uh, command in Desert Storm, uh, U.S. military in wartime, um, the uh, situation on 9-11 when I ended up the guy in the White House in the bunker underneath the White House making those early decisions about how we would respond to 10-11. To and um, the way I looked at it, as I thought about it, was that um, you do everything you can to deal with a medical problem at the moment, but I couldn't get, wait to get back to my job. And if they told me, you can't do that anymore, you're not allowed to function at that level, I'd have been really upset. And uh, I always remember, this is my, uh, my first heart attack, I'm in the hospital in Cheyenne, and there's a young intern there named Rick Davis, there were no cardiologists in those days in Wyoming. But Rick was there, and I'm laying in bed. I got tubes in every part of my anatomy. And, and I said, Rick, does this mean I have to give up my campaign? He said, oh, hell, Dick, hard work never killed anybody. <laughs> now, maybe that's just because he was an intern, uh, an internist. But the fact was that that's what kept me going, was that desire to fix whatever I had to fix, quit the cigarettes, exercise, watch your diet, do all of those things. But at the same time, damn, I wanted to get back to work. Uh, it was, I had a fantastic career, I loved every minute of it, and I didn't want to walk away from it on the grounds that it was stressful. Of course it was stressful. Uh, that's what those jobs are all about. Anyway, I've had this argument with John Reiner now. It's a running argument, been going for some time. He's not quite ready yet to concede my point. He said, you know, maybe I'm a unique case of some kind. But uh, again, it goes back to the, to the um, the, the docs, the profession, the heart association, and everybody else who had invested in new technology and new ways to deal with heart disease, and the fact that it was so good that not only did they keep me alive, but they kept me functioning at about as high a level as you can function in the federal government. That's a perfect transition to, we have a little show and tell now with a ventricular assist device that Wendy's going to explain and both ask a question and show us what it looks like. Remember this? I had an earlier model. <laughs> actually, actually, this is the model you had. This is a HeartMate 2, a left ventricular assist device. It, it was really ugly when they took it out yeah, after I I'd used it for, for years. And this one's clean and never been implanted. So this is an implantable machine that takes over the pumping of the left side of the heart. The placement of one of these machines is a huge undertaking in the best of circumstances. The role of the caregiver in taking care of the patient who has one of these machines is often overlooked and underplayed. Tell us about receiving care and what the roles of your family members were in helping you sure. with this huge thing. Well, what happened, uh, say, 17 months after I left the White House the last time, I was an end-stage heart failure. Injection fraction of about 10. Uh, they put me in the hospital expecting to operate in a day or two, but things went south all of a sudden one night and they uh, decided then to implant the LVAD. Uh, surgery lasted nine hours, over 20 units of blood. I had a lot of scar tissue from previous procedures, so it was a, a touch and go operation, but it saved my life. Eventually uh, kept me going for 20 months, which got me to the transplant, which got me here tonight. The um, surgery was the worst, the toughest I ever had. Uh, not only was it uh, complicated, but I came out from under uh, the uh, anesthetic some weeks later. They put me uh, heavily sedated on a respirator in the ICU for a couple of weeks, and eventually I made it out, obviously, and recovered. But uh, one of the key parts of it was that it, it, you quickly learn you can't do everything that needs to be done as a patient when you're dealing with one of these situations. And um, my wife was absolutely crucial. She saved my life. Uh, when you're on uh, the LVAD, uh, things happen. You know, there was the time we took off. I was selling books in, in um, uh, British Columbia, and I got on the airplane and left, and we left the charger behind for the batteries. It's a bit of a problem. 
<laughs> and how long can you be without the battery? Well, you can't go too long. The batteries run down after about eight hours. But uh, I knew a hospital where they had extra batteries, and so we, made it. we were able to work it out all right. Um, but the, you traveled with a battery pack, go pack at all times, backup batteries. You had to, no matter what you did, you had uh, the shower on a regular basis, but you couldn't do it by yourself, and you had to be very careful of all that gear. You had batteries on the front of you, a drive line that went into your chest and ran the pump. Pumps could do a 9,000 RPMs when it's working. And uh, just to manage the daily routine of life, of, of getting you know, out of bed and into the shower and shave and so forth, really is something you absolutely need help with. And my wife uh, was just remarkable. She, uh, she owned that subject uh, after she'd been briefed into it, what needed to be done and how she needed to help. Um, she knew as much as anybody else about uh, the Elvad and, and what would make it work and, and what not work. It was part of this was the um, situation that John emphasized that the um, stuff that I received from my heart attack when I was uh, 37 in 1978 was about what Dwight Eisenhower had gotten 20 years before in the 50s. But that the technology coming along was just keeping ahead of my disease. And when I needed cholesterol-lowering drugs, there it was. When I needed a quadruple bypass, there it was. And, and um, that was crucial going forward. And the Elvad, as I say, was absolutely essential, a tremendous piece of equipment. The new models, I think, are even better than the one I was on. And um, so I increasingly hear stories about people who choose to live on the Elvad rather than go into the transplant. You should share the one story about the Bose speakers on the plane. <laughs> okay. Well, I, at the time I was, say, I was uh, on the Elvad, I was selling books. First book I wrote in, uh, in my time, it was my own memoir. And uh, my daughter and I were traveling coast to coast. And uh, I was sitting up in first class and I had my Bose noisy, noise canceling earphones on and probably had tuned in some music or something and I'm reading and all of a sudden there's a tap on my shoulder. And uh, it was my daughter who'd come up from steerage. She already had to ride in coach. I was the one riding first class. But uh, she touched my shoulder, and I took off my earphones, and she said, Dad, your uh, machine is buzzing. Well, the alarm was going off because the battery had gotten low, and you could hear it all over the airplane except me with my noise-canceling headphones. So it... Things so happen. That's you either just a have promo for Bose or, or for having a daughter in steerage. Right. <laughs> Wendy? Okay, so for all the Homeland fans in the room, when you passed out behind the wheel and your defibrillator saved your life, were there any special precautions that were taken to prevent your defibrillator from being hacked? Well, they decided, uh, again, as this was a Reiner decision, Shortly after I went to the White House as vice president, so this is a long and summer of 91, that I might be a candidate uh, for sudden cardiac arrest. And based on that, we implanted a uh, defibrillator. And um, it goes just under the skin, wires run down the veins into the chambers of the heart. And it was set to trigger if, in fact, I went into sudden cardiac arrest. Uh, I didn't until we got to the second model. But one of the problems we had with that first model is it could be remotely uh, programmed, and that's the way it had been built. And uh, the Secret Service figured out that uh, if you could program it remotely, and I was working a rope line and there was somebody hostile with the right kind of device, that they could reset my defibrillator without me knowing about it. And that was not something the Secret Service would like to contemplate. So we ended up actually, I think, went to the uh, manufacturer and had him remove that capability uh, so that it reduced my vulnerability. The uh, defibrillator was just fantastic because I was um, in, uh, this would have been uh, December of 09, uh, a few months before I was an NCH heart failure, backing my, out of my uh, garage in Jackson Hole, and uh, I had went into sudden cardiac arrest. My uh, blood pressure dropped to zero. My heart rate hit uh, 220. I was absolutely, totally out of it. The device read the situation. Uh, administered the preset dose, and I was only out 16 seconds, and I was back. Uh, amazing device. And, and, uh, <laughs> uh, 
It, it again was a classic example uh, somebody smart enough to figure out that I would be a candidate and uh, we had, uh, took care of it. So one of the most exciting things I get to do is to call my patients and let them know a donor heart has become available and they're going to get a transplant. What was that experience like for you? Well, um, say I'd been living uh, for 20 months on the LDAD and uh, uh, Lynn and I were getting ready for bed one night, it must have been about 11 o'clock at night, and the phone rang and she answered it and uh, then smiled and handed it to me and uh, they informed me they had a, uh, had a heart for me. And uh, we went to the hospital in over Fairfax there outside Washington and where they installed it and, and did a superb job. What I kept thinking, though, as we were going to the hospital that night was a few weeks before, I'd been watching the evening news. And on the evening news, they had footage of a, uh, a small plane landing at the airport and uh, two guys jumping out with a cooler behind, uh, between them. And they were running across the tarmac to get into the car and they dropped the cooler. And the heart rolled out, wrapped up package. All I could think of was, I hope that's not my team. <laughs> it wasn't, but they grabbed it, chucked it back into the cooler, got in the car, and took off. And somebody's got it out there someplace. I don't know where it is, but uh, it, it literally had, you know, what do you do? You just <laughs> I, uh, I was glad that the team didn't drop it the night they were, they were working on me. And it, it was uh, it's such a feeling after you work so long and, and hard to get through all that period. And all of a sudden, there it is, the gift of life itself. And uh, they um, always be grateful to the donor and the donor's family. I don't know any details about uh, the donor. The docs weren't encouraging in terms of my seeking that information. You can do it. But on the one hand, I felt you know, I was on top of the world. I've got, got my life back. And whoever the donor's family is, they've probably just been through a terrible disaster of some kind, a death in the family. So it's, they did not encourage it. The way I think about it, and I say I'm always making a point to thank the donor and the donor's family, but I think of it as my new heart. I don't spend a lot of time wondering about the characteristics of, of the individual who donated the heart that I was able to use. Could be a Democrat. Don't want to get into that sort of thing. So. It could be a Russian. <laughs> Well, I just have to say one thing, because those of us that get to spend time with him in very special moments, I, we're always saying, do you think you have some different characteristics? And one of the ones is that we do think that he's a little bit more chatty. <laughs> so as you alluded to, from pacemakers to cholesterol-reducing statins, throughout your heart journey, you have been extremely fortunate. Right when your disease progressed, the next technology was right on board. Tell us about when the American Heart Association works to cure cardiovascular disease, your thoughts about the importance of continuing to fund research that supports groundbreaking discoveries. Well, it, it's, I'm just tremendously amazed when I think about it. And of course, all of this becomes much more um, immediate kind of a problem when you're on the receiving end of all that new technology. But uh, I can't say enough about how fast our technology is moving what a tremendous service is being rendered by all of those who support it financially, who are involved in actually carrying out the research. Uh, it's just a, one of the remarkable traits of our, of our civilization in the 21st century. It's a, um, a tremendous achievement uh, for medicine. Uh, there are a lot of them, but of course the one I'm most familiar with is uh, those things that relate to the heart. But as I mentioned before, the uh, the way John, my uh, cardiologist, described it, he said, Cheney, he said, it's like you got up in the morning to go to work, and you're late, and every stoplight along the road is red. But he said, when you hit them, every darn one of them turned green. And that's a pretty good explanation of uh, sort of how I thought about the, the process we were going through. Okay, we're at, we're at our final question, and it's for both Dr. Debbie and the Vice President to answer. Uh, in a sh few minutes, we're going to watch a short video from the Tampa Bay community. And one of the questions that they're going to ask is, what does a future look like without heart disease? What would you have to say about that, sir? Well, um, I, I have not been involved. Well, I'm trying to think how to design it. Uh, 
the, my care and treatment has been involved uh, uh, minimizing the impact of heart disease in various cases, stretching out my life in spite of uh, the fact that I had heart disease, various ways to uh, make it possible to live with it and, and function. Um, so I've never been in a mindset where I thought of it as a matter of eliminating heart disease. Well, when you get down to the transplant proposition, obviously, that's a whole different proposition. Uh, the good thing about the technology that's going on to, to eliminate the disease itself is we get around the problem that we don't have nearly as many donors as we do uh, prospective recipients. And uh, I am, say, uh, I've seen it with my own life. I'm here tonight because of the what I would call a miracle of modern medicine in the heart area. And uh, I think the, the days that are ahead of us, with the work that all of you do through the Heart Association here in Tampa, uh, was gonna produce some really phenomenal results. Thank you. Dr. Debbie? So a future with heart without heart disease will enable many of us to live, as the old saying goes, to the ripe age of 120, to celebrate more occasions with family and friends to enable the $209 billion spent in the United States on heart disease every year to be spent on something else. And for me personally, unemployment. <laughs> well, I'd like to say thank you everybody, especially to Dr. Debbie Wendy Hoffman and, uh, and Vice President Cheney for participating in this.